Two weeks ago, we promised to buck the usual annual October month trend of every podcast everywhere and avoid doing spooky themed episodes just because people like dressing up once a year and putting on masks. Something we've all become a bit too good at of late. This year has been its own kind of horror show so far, we're sure you'll agree, and we see no reason to add to it. Instead, we decided we would take the opportunity squandered by everyone else doing the same thing and spend it instead on making sure you felt a bit better. That you could come away from our episodes this month with a case of the warm fuzzies. Which, clearly, we have undoubtedly done so far. Now, while we're always happy for a bit of listener feedback, it struck us a bit odd when longtime listener and friend of the show Ivar reacted to one of our episode announcements on Twitter with a statement in support of our warm and fuzzy theme and a jife from Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Clearly, he associated the clip of the two main characters, Belle and the Beast, with such warm and fuzzy feelings. Which is exactly what struck us as so odd. See, the story of Beauty and the Beast isn't really all that comforting. Oh sure, there's a bit about looking beyond the surface appearance of someone to see what they're really like on the inside. But in this day and age, anyone with an x-ray machine can do that, and probably find out way more than you wanted to know in the first place. Just like they used to do in the bad old days of Halloween, when you were allowed to wander around the neighborhood in the dark and collect razor blades from apples. But the thing of it is, that's just the tiniest part of the whole Beauty and the Beast story. Even then, it's thrown in almost as an afterthought, as if to give the story some sort of moral and make it okay for everyone to read. Like all those toy commercial cartoons from the 80s, which had to have some knowing is half the battle educational component. As we'll see, the story of Beauty and the Beast that we all know best, the one about the poor innocent prince transformed into a beast by a curse and rescued by the true love of beauty in a heartwarming and wholesome tale for the whole family about looking deeper and finding beauty within is, well, not exactly what the original author had in mind. But never mind that. Let's get to the good stuff as quickly as possible in the true story of Beauty and the Beast. Cue the CGI, get those plates dancing, and by golly, let's all share some warm fuzzies as we invite you to be our guest. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. You might, for unspecified reasons, be tempted to think that the story of Beauty and the Beast is a tale as old as time. But the fact of the matter is, it isn't. It only dates back to 1740. French author Gabriel Suzanne de Villeneuve created the story for a collection of fairy tales called, and we're translating here, The Young American and Marine Tales, a collection of fairy tales for the whole family. But rather than being a short little story among other short little stories as we've become accustomed to in more modern fairy tale collections, Beauty and the Beast was a complicated novel length tale. Sure, it told a version of the story that we would recognize, provided we squint a little, but it also dove into the depths of both the Beast and Beauty's backstories and that of their families. And it's a wonder to behold, de Villeneuve worked for a time for the French literary censor and used that time to get in touch with the literary tastes of the French public. And you'll be hard pressed to believe what they were into, apparently. Beauty's father, and yes, her name is Beauty, we suspect because her father was running out of names as you'll see, Beauty's father was a widower and father to twelve children. Six boys and six girls, which seems like a lot, but things were different then. Each of the children was handsome and or beautiful as expected, but Beauty was, of course, the most beautiful of all. She was also the youngest, the most well-read, the kindest, and the most pure of heart. We expect she was also the biggest pain in the butt to the other siblings, but who are we to judge? You can only take so much of that sort of thing before it starts to grate on the older children. It probably didn't help that the oldest two girls were described as cruel, selfish, vain, and spoiled. They were used to getting what they wanted when they wanted it, 
and we're sure Dad being a widower didn't help any. Fortunately, he was a merchant and so had access to many fine things which the older girls were happy to take advantage of on a regular basis. Beauty was, of course, just happy to be alive. More or less. Probably she wandered around with her head in a book, singing little songs apropos of nothing. You can never tell with these sorts of families. Anyway, it all came crashing down around their ears when dear old dad the merchant sent out a big fleet of goods to be traded at the nearest major port, only to have the whole kit and caboodle sunk by pirates on the way. Since dad wasn't the sensible kind of merchant, there was no insurance on the cargo, and he'd sunk every bit of the family fortune into it, which left the family destitute and living in a barn. All 12 kids had to go to work to earn a living and keep the family afloat. Now, Beauty takes it all more or less in stride, but her older sisters, having been firmly established as the villains of the piece by now, resent her can-do, go-getter attitude and decide she must be out of her gourd. So they force her into doing housework for people in order to earn her keep and get the family back into a proper home. Not along with them, mind you, just by herself, they were far too important to take on actual jobs. A year later, word reaches Dad that one of his merchant ships has survived and arrived in port. Why it took them a year to get there and get word back to their employer is never adequately explained. But Dad rushes off to recover what he can of the family fortune by selling off the goods to make good on his investment. Just before leaving, He asks his children if they would like him to bring anything special back for them to celebrate their return to prosperity. The boys all want horses and swords and bows and stuff to go hunting with. But the girls want fancy dresses and jewelry and other such finery because Dad doesn't know how to set limits or expectations or even how to say no with any amount of authority. All except Beauty, who, naturally, wants nothing in particular except that her father be safe. Yep, she's exactly the kind of person you can't shop for on their birthday or at Christmas time because she never, ever has any clear idea of what she might like or enjoy and refuses to help you figure out something when you ask. You can begin to see what the sisters had to put up with, with her around all the time, spoiling the fun and making them look bad. Eventually, after Dad begs and pleads with her to give him any hint at all about something she might like because the last time they went through this, she didn't seem too happy with the gift card she ended up with, she gives in and asks for a single rose, noting that no roses grew during the past year. Which means there is some sort of rose scarcity, we suppose. And we know what happens when there is a scarcity. Prices go up. Never mind the additional cost of acquiring a live plant in a foreign port, taxes and excise, export tariffs, import tariffs, and the cost of preserving it during a long sea voyage so that she ended up with something that looked like a rose by the time it got back to her and not a bit of raggedy brown paper on a stick. So probably she was only asking for the most expensive thing she could think of at the time. Armed with an extensive shopping list, Dad heads out the door, no doubt pleased to be away from his 12 children for any amount of time at all. We're sure many of you can sympathize with the poor man, having been shut inside with your own children for several months now. Our sympathies to any of you who actually do have 12. When he gets to whatever port his ship is docked at, he discovers not everything is sunshine and... roses. See, the thing about investing in a fleet and cargo is that you more or less have to borrow from Peter on the promise of payment from Paul. And a year after things were supposed to have gone smoothly, no really we promise, what happens is Peter starts wondering when he gets paid back. Sure enough, once he arrives in port, dad discovers the creditors have seized what little cargo remained to pay off his debts, and he is left with nothing. Not even a scrap. So much for hunting gear, dresses, and roses. Forced to take the long way home, the merchant sets out overland, unable to afford the price of, well, anything at this point. To make matters worse, a big storm whips up over the horizon and turns out to be one of those once-a-century types that very nearly kills the man 
before he comes across a weird old palace in which to seek shelter. No one invites him in, but he decides trespassing is okay since no one seems to be home, which is not an assumption you can get away with making when the police come to check, but there you go. No police are about, apparently. You begin to see where the children get their weird moral compass from. He's amazed to discover that it looks for all the world like someone must have been expecting him, rather than the far more likely explanation that everything has been made ready for someone who is only temporarily absent and soon to return. There's food laid on, the fire is warm, and there's even a dessert course. Probably the owner of the palace is just upstairs putting on his dinner jacket, but Dad the merchant thinks it's all some gift meant for him anyway. To add insult to breaking and entering and theft, he finds a bed upstairs to sleep in without even bothering to change out of his rain-soaked clothes. Honestly, some people's parents. Having taken on an unwarranted proprietary view of the whole palace based on the fact that he wasn't murdered in the night by the rightful owner of the estate, he decides to add a bit of vandalism to his list of crimes when he notices a rose garden on the way out and decides he can finally get away with a cheap gift for beauty by taking a rose. You know, just like you did as a kid when you raided someone else's flower beds to make a bouquet for mom. Don't fib to us, we know you did it. And so does your mom. She's not dumb, you know. Anyway, no sooner does he take the rose than the owner of the joint shows up and demands to know just what exactly is going on. Suddenly overcome with a thin, warm streak of honesty at the sight of the palace's owner, who turns out to be a big, giant, hairy monster sort of thing that threatens to kill him for taking a flower from among a garden of many, even though he'd been allowed the comforts of the beast's personal home the night before, which if you ask us is a bit of an extreme reaction in the face of all the other crimes he's committed, Dad confesses all and lays out the whole tedious story, probably going way back to the start of the whole thing when he first decided that having a dozen children was any kind of a good idea in the first place. No doubt confused, bewildered, and yet strangely sympathetic to the merchant's plight, the beast agrees to allow the merchant to take the rose in exchange for which, on top of all the other things the merchant has already taken from him, Beast will also agree to take one of his children off his hands. Namely, this beauty Dad has talked up perhaps a little too much. In fact, so convincing a sales pitch has Dad made that the Beast says he intends to treat her as his fiance, which means he will assume all financial and legal responsibility for her for the rest of his life instead of her father. It's worth noting at this point that none of Dad's other daughters, or sons for that matter, seem to have had any sort of standing offer or even interested suitor. Probably everyone else in the area knew a bad deal when they saw it and kept well away. Rather than thanking his lucky stars that he's not actually dead and now has one less child to deal with for the rest of his life, Dad hightails it out of there and almost immediately wonders if he did the right thing. This, in spite of the fact that not only does the beast take on beauty, he also provides for the entirety of the rest of the family with dresses and riches and hunting gear and all the other things they would need to not actually be poor and starve to death. We've carefully weighed the evidence and decided that yes, yes, he did do the right thing. He would have been a fool not to. In fact, what he should probably do from here on out is spend all the other stormy nights that blow in laying up in any castle, palace, mansion, or other estate building he can find in the hopes of striking it lucky again and unloading the rest of the children. In any case, at this point it is important to keep in mind that the beast has done nothing wrong at all except overreact a little to the theft of a rose. Well aware that the beast has warned him not to fail to send beauty to him lest he risk the destruction of his entire family, Dad, of course, decides not to tell anyone anything when he finally gets home. Seriously, the guy is made out like an absolute bandit and is very much on the plus side of the ledger, and yet he still thinks his best course of action is to not even mention anything about the agreement, which up to this point has totally benefited him in every conceivable way. Fortunately, Beauty is one of those pesky children who keeps pestering him about his trip and incredibly good fortune until he caves in and tells her the truth just to get her to shut up. 
Once the rest of the family finds out, the brothers, who've clearly played way too many of those video games we hear about in the news every so often, jump up and offer to ride out and kill the beast because that, obviously, will fix everything by adding premeditated murder to the crimes committed by the family as a way of saying thanks for restoring our fortunes and easing our future life of toil. Meanwhile, the older daughters are very much of the opinion that somehow this is all Beauty's fault even though she wasn't there and had nothing to do with anything besides wanting one of the world's most expensive roses. It's clearly her fault that her father doesn't have any respect for property rights. The merchant forbids anyone from doing anything with regard to the beast, especially Beauty. In fact, double especially Beauty, even though her not showing up at the palace means the entire family will be killed by the beast. Fortunately, as evidenced by her earlier request for an expensive imported rose, Beauty has a better head for business than the rest of the family and sneaks out late at night to go to the palace and meet the beast anyway, without anyone else knowing. When she arrives at the palace, the beast is very pleased to see her indeed. So pleased that the very first thing he does after saying, Hello, how are you? I'm the beast in case you couldn't tell, is put on an entire cabaret just for her. And here we had to pause and look up what a cabaret was just in case we'd misunderstood. No, we had it right. A cabaret in the time de Villeneuve is writing meant a sit-down restaurant where music, dance, drama, and other entertainments were performed. So, the Beast put on an entire sit-down restaurant with tables, chairs, a bar, kitchen staff, a variety of performers, and possibly an entire dramatic play with a script and cast, all for beauty. She must have been overwhelmed. Can you imagine? On top of all that, he lavishes her with more food and clothing and attempts to be a charming conversationalist. Except Beauty discovers he's not very good at that conversation thing because he's a bit thick. He gets talking about weather down pretty well, and he's certainly okay when it comes to the mindless little trifles of casual conversation we all engage in just to fill space, but he lacks any depth. And you shouldn't be at all surprised when we tell you that the French word for beast in the original title of this novel, La Belle et la Bête, meant both beast and stupid. Also, you now know why Beauty is often referred to as Belle. In any case, the Beast does his dead level best to entertain and amaze Beauty for the entire evening. But it all comes crashing to an abrupt close at the end of the night when he just straight up asks her to come upstairs and look at his etchings. You probably don't know about the etchings because Disney isn't as handy with the euphemisms as we are. But it's true. He just throws it out there like he expects it to work, and... Maybe if Beauty hadn't had six brothers and five older sisters who no doubt had many interesting things to say about etchings over the years, she'd have fallen for it. But Beauty is having none of it and refuses his ham-fisted invitation. When she retires to her assigned bedroom, by herself, we add, and falls asleep, her dreams are all about a handsome prince with whom she dances the entire night away. For an entire month, this goes on. Sumptuous meals, expensive gifts, awkward conversations, and inappropriate suggestions to close the evening, followed by dreams of dancing. During the day, Beauty prowls the palace looking into its rooms and discovering TV. No, seriously. See, Beauty comes to believe that the Beast is captured and is hiding the prince somewhere on the property. So she spends her free time going from room to room looking for him, and seeing whatever there is to see. Some of the rooms she opens contain enchanted windows, and by looking through them she is able to attend the theater, and if that doesn't sound like a 55-inch widescreen OLED TV, we don't know what does. And, lest you think Disney added a bunch of stuff to their version of the events to pad things out, the entire palace is littered with animated furnishings and fixtures, all of which act like servants to the other occupants of the house. But never once... Does she come across the prince anywhere on the grounds, in spite of finding all its libraries, aviaries, and executive bowling alleys? Finally, exasperated at the incredible amount of work she's put into things so far without actually reaching the end of the novel, and having written beauty as unexpectedly dense as she has, de Villeneuve summons up from nowhere the fairy of plot advancement. She shows up to tell beauty to stop being so dumb and maybe take the beast up on his offer to see his etchings after all. 
Beauty explains that she doesn't have any etchings to show the beast in return because they're just friends. And anyway, she wouldn't know how to show him an etching even if she wanted to, which she doesn't. We remind you, six brothers and five older sisters. She has to know something about etchings. Exasperated, the fairy takes off, but not before urging Beauty to look beyond Beast's skin and maybe slipping her a pamphlet or two and is never heard from again. Now keep in mind, Beauty has been given everything she wants and then some. She's entertained and wears exquisite clothes and eats amazing meals and her every whim is catered to and, except for one awkward moment each evening when the Beast insists on mentioning his etchings, everything is pretty wonderful. Still, she is unsatisfied with her newfound position in life. See, she misses home, having forgotten what her family is like and how her sisters treated her the last time she was there and what absolute morons her brothers are. Still, there's dad. But what can you do? You don't get to pick your relatives. Sadly. So she asks the beast to let her go home for a visit. He agrees. But having learned nothing from his meeting with her father, he makes her promise to come back in a week, no later. Or maybe he did learn something about the extended family. When Beauty is transported home thanks to a magic ring, her sisters are a bit stuck on all her fine clothes and jewels. They can't get enough of them, and Beauty, bless her little storybook heart, attempts to share all the pretty things with them. Except they are enchanted, so that every time Beauty hands a dress to one of her sisters, it turns into shabby rags, and then back into a beautiful dress when she picks it up again. The Beast has taken care to make sure the clothes and other goodies are just for her. Where did the Beast learn all this magic, one begins to wonder. Naturally, they become extremely jealous of her. When Beauty explains she has to be back at the palace by the weekend, they try to talk her out of it and convince her the Beast has it in for her. And dear old dad hasn't been idle either. He's arranged a marriage for Beauty to one of her cousins, even though he knows that she is up at the palace in an arranged marriage deal already that saved his life. And he threatens to disown her if she doesn't go through with it. He even goes so far as to snatch the magic ring off her hand to keep her from going back. When she demurs, citing the promise she made to the beast, her brothers get mad at her thinking she, quote unquote, knows too much about the beast. Definitely in the etching sense, which they clearly know all about. The entire family is now angry at Beauty and plotting against her. Beauty is, of course, frightened by the whole lot of them and feels forced to agree to the marriage for her own safety, even though it means she won't be able to go back to the Beast on time. Not ever again, you notice, merely on time. She's plotting just as hard as they are, it seems. A week passes, and Beauty suddenly starts having visions of the Beast dying. Afraid for him, she manages to steal the magic ring back from her father while he is out and hastily puts it on, departing post-haste for the palace. On arriving, she finds the Beast laying on the floor awash in his own blood, murdered by an angry mob, stirred up by her father, in order to prevent the Beast ever having any hold over anyone in the family. She bursts into tears, laments that she never learned how to love him in the etching sense, and claims it was all her fault. Which, somehow, restores the beast to life and to his proper form as the prince she danced with in her dreams. He explains that his curse was placed on him by a witch who turned him into a hideous beast because, get this, he wouldn't go see her etchings after she'd gone to all the trouble of seducing him in the first place, and that meant he was selfish and deserved to be punished, a trick which he then tried on Beauty himself. But never mind. They get married, and it's happily ever after in spite of all the evidence to the contrary that there is no way this is a healthy union. The End And thus, we've been taught that timeless and important lesson. Beauty is only skin deep, and it's what's inside that counts. Or possibly, nothing is ever as it seems, including your own family, especially when it comes to money. Or maybe never repay vandalism with kindness. 
We don't really know what lesson we were supposed to learn from that. So we'll fall back on the classic, Man was the real monster all along. Warm fuzzies indeed. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. It's a bit different, but we hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Many thanks to our patrons on Patreon and elsewhere who continue to support the show even through these little experiments. If you'd like to help too, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top of any page. That'll take you to our support page where you can find several different methods to choose from. Pick the one that suits you best. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian. Again, not that Harry Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Well, there's the usual things. Flowers, chocolates, promises you don't intend to keep, 